thank you again for joining me for the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's seasonal stargazing series. So this is the first part and obviously a four part series. And today we'll talk about the spring sky. And you can see the title of this presentation is the king of spring. And I'm sure you're wondering who or what is the king of spring, but don't worry, we're gonna find out today. So winter is now finally behind us, you know, thank goodness. But don't get me wrong, winter nights are wonderful. If you've ever wondered why the winter sky seems to have an extra sparkle, that's because of the 25 brightest stars in the sky, 18 of which are visible at our latitude, nine shine during a cold, clear winter night. So you could say roughly half of the brightest stars that we can see in the Northern Hemisphere are all in the winter time. So that's why the winter sky seems to be so spectacular. We have, of course, Orion the Hunter and the winter hexagon. So when it is clear on a winter night, the winter sky is spectacular, as you can see in this picture here. But of course, for those of us that at least live in Michigan, this wonderful picture is not your typical winter night. This is a typical winter night in Michigan. Overcast, gray, very cold, most likely snow on the ground, maybe even some ice in the trees as we see here. Uh, it's very still at night in the winter. You don't hear any wildlife. There are no mosquitoes, that's a plus, but still the frostbite gets you worse than the mosquitoes. And so, yeah, we do not get a lot of clear nights during the winter in Michigan. But of course, the seasons, they are a changing. So back on December 21st, roughly, the sun was as far south of the celestial equator as it gets. And so that is the first day of winter. But the good news about the first day of winter is after that day, after the winter uh, solstice, days begin to get longer. So they get longer and longer throughout the winter until the sun now uh, shines directly above Earth's equator because it's on this day that the ecliptic, the apparent path of the sun in the sky or the Earth's orbit projected into the sky is in, on the point where the ecliptic and the celestial equator cross, which we call a node. So as seen at least from the equator for certain, you have equal numbers of daylight and darkness. It's not quite equal at our latitude, but it, you know, it varies depending on where you live. But as we now get into spring here, things will begin to warm up and everything will come back to life. We'll get leaves on those bare trees and of course uh, flowers and plants will begin to grow. But not only do we uh, kind of begin to come out of our long winter hibernation, and not only does everything come to life, but spring kind of represents a new season of stargazing for many of us, because we just don't like to venture out during a cold, clear winter night. So yeah, things are improving. The Again, the average nightly low temperatures are getting better, because again, this is the nightly low temperature, because of course you can't really observe very much during the day, except for the sun. But you can see uh, the temperatures are still below 30 degrees Fahrenheit here in March. So burr, that's pretty cold. But once we really get into the bulk of spring here, April and May, that's when it gets at least above freezing. And my favorite observing temperature is around 40, 45 degrees, because as I like to say, it's too warm for frost, too cold for bugs. So I do, uh, I do love me some 45 degree observing weather. It is the perfect temperature, in my opinion. It might be too cold for some people, but again, you don't get any mosquitoes and you don't have to worry too much about frostbite. So not only are the skies getting clear, at least for those of us again here in Michigan, but also the, uh, the you know, we, we get more and more clear skies. We get this funny bump here in March. I never quite understood that. 
you know, we go from roughly two clear nights in January and February, then we jump up to over five in March, and then we kind of go up in April, but then kind of down a bit in May, at least historically on average. This is roughly 20 years of data or so. So as we really get into the bulk of spring, we get more clear nights to play with, and it's not freezing cold outside. So in short, it's time to get ready to observe on a spring night. So here are some necessities of the night. If you're an absolute novice in amateur astronomy, you know, you're just starting out, the first thing you'll need is a star map. Now, of course, magazines like say Astronomy, Sky and Telescope have their uh, centerfold all sky star map. And, but there are other sources you can uh, easily print out and not worry about getting all dewy and wet torn uh, but you can go of course you can go to skymaps.com they have a free downloadable all sky monthly star map but the one shown here is the one that i created for the kalamazoo astronomical society uh, this goes in our monthly newsletter prime focus but i also uh, make the star chart here available for separate download from our website so every single month you can go to either the main page of our website or almost every sub page, except for the gallery section. And somewhere on there, uh, you'll find a link to download our monthly star chart. So it's available to download for free once a month, every month. Or of course you can download it more than once a month if you want, but if you lose a copy, you can download it again. So it's totally free. But the really bad thing about these uh, uh, fixed all sky monthly star maps, is of course they show you the sky for a specific time of night. So if you try to use the star, uh, star chart, say at like you know three or four o'clock in the morning, it might not be too valuable. That's where a planisphere comes into play. Now I know you're wondering or saying to yourself, well, I have this app on my phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah let, just for once, put the phone away because those screens will ruin your night vision. More on that later. And it's just time for once to put away the technology. Don't look at your screens, but look at a star map and look up toward the stars themselves. So a planisphere really is like a computer but it doesn't require any apps or batteries or any uh, operating software. So it's a computer like the Abacus is a computer. So you simply turn the star wheel, which is another name for a planisphere, to the date and time that you're outside. And it shows you all the currently visible stars and constellations. So if you are out at you know, 3.55 in the morning, you can set your star chart for that date at 3.55 in the morning. Shown here is the Miller Planisphere, which we sell on our website. You just got to go to the Sky Shop and you can purchase your own Miller Planisphere. So they're all great for the naked eye. But when you get into using optical aid, you know, like binoculars or a telescope, uh, you're going to want to get yourself a star atlas. Now, my favorite star atlas is the one shown here, Sky and Telescope's Pocket Sky Atlas, the Jumbo Edition, because there's the original Pocket Sky Atlas that's a bit smaller. It's like a little bit bigger than your paperback book, but the, the Pocket Sky Atlas is like, you know, the, the size of a larger storybook. And so it's a little easier to read out at night. And I've taken the liberty of scanning some of the pages here from the uh, Pocket Sky Atlas and use them throughout my presentation. So I wanted to give Sky and Telescope a nice little plug for their jumbo uh, edition Pocket Sky Atlas because it is great. And, and you'll see some of the charts here as examples. Now, of course, you can print your own custom charts too. There are plenty of uh, you know, desktop planetarium programs where you can create your own custom star maps for the exact type of observing that you want to do. So there's ones like uh, the Sky X or shown here, Starry Night Pro Plus. Uh, Starry Night Pro is up to version 8. I know this says version 7, but they don't really have a nice uh, graphic here uh, for version 8. Uh, so they're up to version 8 now, and there are different versions of Starry Night and the Sky X. Um, this is the most expensive one, uh, Pro Plus, which is the version that I use. It gives a realistic image 
of the sky. But there's a free version called Stellarium. And so you can download Stellarium, and it is a fantastic program if you don't want to fork out the money for uh, even the cheapest version of the Sky X or Starry Night. Now, of course, when you do go out and use your star map or planisphere or star atlas, you're going to want to get yourself a red flashlight. You can make one, of course. You can cover a regular flashlight with like red tape or red plastic, uh, but it's better really to ultimately get a dedicated red flashlight, you know, with red LEDs, but you don't want one that's too bright. A lot of people think even though it's red, it can be as bright as I want. Nope. Um, you want a light just bright enough to read star charts by and no brighter. So you want a red light to preserve your night vision. So you know at night or when it gets dark, your pupils dilate. You know, your pupils get wider to bring in more light. But there's another function to your eyes where this uh, uh, chemical, this protein called rhodopsin builds up in your eye. Now, for young folks, you can build up this rhodopsin to become more dark adapted in about 20 minutes. But for older people, it can take uh, between 40 and even 60 minutes to build up your full dark adaption with rhodopsin. But if your eyes are exposed to white light, like from a really newbie with a bright flashlight or a passing car, uh, the rhodopsin gets bleached out. And then you have to start building up your dark adaption all over again. But red light doesn't uh, uh, bleach out the rhodopsin unless it's really bright. So red light is the color to use. Now, of course, you want to get some binoculars, too. It's always best to start out in amateur astronomy by uh, learning your constellations with a monthly star chart or planisphere. But eventually you want to work your way up to binoculars. I know a lot of people just like to jump to the telescope. But as we learned in the lecture series available on YouTube, of course, is that if you use a telescope right away, you'll get frustrated because you probably won't be able to find anything in the sky because you haven't learned the bright stars and major constellations yet. But binoculars, they fill the gap between what the naked eye and a telescope can do. So in short, for handheld astronomy, you want to use either 7 by 50 or 10 by 50 binoculars. 7 by 50 if you're younger than 30 for sure, but as you get older, your eyes don't dilate as wide, so 10 by 50 binoculars become better. We won't get into the details as of why, but trust me, older folks should use 10 by 50s, or young folks should use 7 by 50s. And then of course, you're gonna wanna use a telescope. For springtime, uh, really more than almost any other season. Because as we'll see, springtime is galaxy time. And galaxies require aperture, which refers to the size of either the mirror or the lens. You know, because some telescopes have lenses, some telescopes have mirrors. This telescope here, which is an 8-inch Newtonian on a Dobsonian mount, it has a mirror. So, you know, people always ask me, you know, yeah, I know, Richard, you want me to, you know, learn the constellations and get binoculars, but I really want a telescope. What telescope should I get? Huh, huh Richard, tell me. So the answer is, if you really got to get a telescope before you're ready, just buy a six inch or eight inch Dobsonian as shown here. Uh, because Dobsonians, as we say in amateur astronomy, you get the most bang for your buck. You can buy a large Dobsonian for a relatively low price, and they're very quick and easy to set up, and they're very quick and easy to take down. So, you know, they might not be really portable, but you can even get one like this with a collapsible tube, if you can get one right now. They're on major, major back order, most of the time anyway. But Dobsonians are great because, again, you can buy a big one for a low price, and they are really easy to set up and take down and use. Now, if you do get a non-computerized telescope, you know, a, a telescope with a computer built into fine stuff, you know, which is great. Um, but if you have a non-go-to, non-computerized telescope like a Dobsonian, you want to get yourself a Telrad finder. So these are one power finders. You know, they, they don't magnify and they give this heads up 
uh, bullseye display. When you kind of view through the window, you know, you don't stick your eye like right, right up to the Telrad, but you kind of view it from back a little bit and it makes like a little projection of the bullseye in the sky. So I once had a guy buy a telescope for me because I used to sell telescopes a long time ago and he couldn't find anything with his Dobsonian. So I said, here, buy this Telrad, buy these Telrad charts. And then he came back and said, I can find stuff like crazy now. So yeah, get yourself a Telrad finder for any non-go-to computerized telescope. Now, of course, your telescope will come with at least one or two eyepieces, but it's really good to have at least three to your collection, like say a 40 millimeter, a 20 to 26 millimeter, and a 10 millimeter for higher magnification. So it's good to have at least three eyepieces in your collection. You can get the pretty two inch versions. Uh, some have a two inch barrel, some have inch and a quarter. If they're smaller than inch and a quarter, uh, don't buy them, they're junk. But most eyepieces are either inch and a quarter or two inch today. And you can find lots of good quality eyepieces for low prices today. And of course, many of us live with light pollution nearby because we're stuck near the big cities for work. So you want to get yourself a collection of deep sky filters. Now, the uh, narrow band filters or kind of line filters, like a, a, a narrow band or UHC filter or a line filter called an O3 filter, these are more for nebulae. Same goes with an H beta filter, but frankly, they're not much good for anything. But for springtime, at least, you want to get yourself a broad band or deep sky filter like this one to filter out natural uh, or, or you know, natural sky glow, I guess, if you have really dark skies, uh, but unnatural light pollution, you know, from, from cities. So a broad band or deep sky filter is what you want to view everything we're going to talk about today, star clusters and galaxies. And now, if you do have a star map, eyepieces, you know, binoculars, you're going to want to get yourself something to put them on. So it's good to have a table. And this is just like the table that I use. It's meant for camping, but uh, Orion telescopes and binoculars, they've been selling this table for years for astronomy as well. This one rolls up into a nice little tube, sort of. And uh, so it's very portable. And there are other camping tables that fold up nicely because, of course, you want a table to be portable as you drag it out into the field. Now, if you are hardcore and like to observe for several hours, especially with a Dobsonian, you're going to want to get yourself an observing chair. You can try a regular chair at first for sure, but with a regular chair, you really can't adjust the height. But you can see with this chair, you can move it up and down uh, to you know, get the proper height to com comfortably view through your eyepiece. And if you're just starting out as an amateur astronomer, or you've been doing this for a couple of years and haven't been doing this, but keep an observing log. You can just do it for the sake of doing it. But of course, there are many observing programs from the Astronomical League, if you're a member of the AL, either through a affiliate club or as a member at large, um, so, but at least keep an observing log. You can do it old school. You know, as you observe through the eyepiece, you can take notes and maybe make little sketches in your notebook. Or you can dictate your notes into a digital recorder. With these digital recorders today, or those you have built into your phone, you could record, you know, just hours and hours of, you know, observations or even, you know, entire, like, college-level courses. And, then you can buy a program like, say, Deep Sky Planner and enter your logs into Deep Sky Planner. You could even scan and enter your sketches into Deep Sky Planner as well. So those are the necessities of the night. Now it's time to begin our grand tour of the spring sky. And as I alluded to, spring is different uh, compared to, say, summer or winter. So spring is more comparable to the autumn than it is to any other season, because as any amateur astronomer knows that's been doing this for a while, springtime is galaxy season. Why is that? Why do we have kind of galaxy seasons in the winter, or I'm sorry, the autumn and the spring? And why do we have more Milky Way objects in the summer and in the winter? Well, that's pretty simple. So here's an artistic view 
of what we think our galaxy looks like, the Milky Way. So this isn't just some random drawing, but it's based on actual data of what we think our galaxy looks like when viewed from the outside. Now you might think that the solar system, uh, you know, the, the plane of the solar system, which we can call the ecliptic, you know, the, the ecliptic is the apparent uh, path of the sun, it's the Earth's orbit projected into the sky, but we measure all the orbital tilts of the planets with respect to the ecliptic, you know, our orbit. So the ecliptic is really also the plane of the solar system. And you might think the plane of the solar system is parallel to the disk of our galaxy, but it's not. So the angle between the ecliptic and what we call the galactic equator is 60.2 degrees, as you can see in this diagram here. So more or less, the sun orbits the galaxy almost face on. So in the summer, when the nighttime side of Earth is pointed toward the center of our galaxy, we have galaxy season. We observe open clusters and nebulae. Uh, you know, emission nebulae, planetary neb nebulae, and supernova remnants. So during the nighttime and the summer, we're pointed toward the center of the galaxy. In the winter, we're pointed in the opposite direction because it's the opposite season. So in the winter, the nighttime side of Earth is pointed toward the outskirts of our galaxy. And you'll notice, of course, if you've been observing the sky for a long time, the summer Milky Way is a lot brighter than the winter Milky Way. Because again, in the summer, we're looking toward downtown Milky Way. Lots and lots and lots of stars and deep sky objects. In the winter, we're looking toward, again, the outskirts of the galaxy. So there are fewer stars and deep sky objects, but there's still a lot to observe in the winter. But then things change in the autumn. In the autumn, we look, quote, below the disk, how we define up or down. So this would be like the north pole of the galaxy. Uh, so in the uh, fall or the autumn, we look under the disk out to distant galaxies. And the spring, right now, the opposite season, we look above the plane of the galaxy to, again, deep space truly deep sky objects, the other galaxies. So today we're gonna to see lots of galaxies. So with any good tour of the sky, we begin with Ursa Major, the Great Bear. Now Ursa Major is not technically a spring constellation because Ursa Major, the Great Bear, is a circumpolar constellation from at least my latitude of 42 degrees. So to be a circumpolar constellation, that means the constellation never rises or sets. In the fall, um, the feet of the Great Bear do set below our horizon, but because this part of the constellation, the Big Dipper, uh, still remains above the horizon, we still consider Ursa Major a circumpolar constellation, even though technically it is. So, but Ursa Major is best in the springtime because it rides high in the sky. Again, in the fall, the opposite season, we really can't see it. It's technically above the horizon, but it's hidden behind the trees. In the spring, it's really, really high in the sky. You really got to crank your neck up a bit just to even see the thing. So here are the familiar uh, seven stars of the Big Dipper. We have three stars in the handle, four stars in the bowl. And you can see the Big Dipper is an asterism, a unofficial group of stars within the constellation Ursa Major. Some asterisms are made up of bright stars from multiple constellations. We actually won't see any of those today, not in the springtime. Now, the Big Dipper is really important because we can use it for navigation all over the sky, or we can use it for star hopping, moving from star to object to star and so on. So what we can do is, of course, we can use the Big Dipper itself to find Ursa Major, and then we can use these two stars at the far end of the bowl that we call the pointer stars. And so when you draw a line out from the pointer stars, 
out from the top of the bowl of the dipper, which is now the bottom, I guess, uh, but out from the whitest part of the bowl, we'll say now, you draw a line of equal length to the Big Dipper, and you stop at a star of equal brightness to the pointer stars, and sure enough, that takes you to Polaris, the North Star. And as you go straight down in the sky, that shows you where due north is in the sky. So Polaris is at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. But in this case, the Little Dipper and Ursa Minor, the lesser bear, are exactly the same. There are no extra stars um, for the, the little bear. So here's what they look like in the sky. And they are kind of unusual looking because they have those long bushy tails. But I'll just give you the short version here today. Uh, space bears have tails. <laughs> so our first deep sky target is within the constellation Ursa Major. But it's in kind of an obscure part of Ursa Major near the bear's ear. So here we have two for the price of one. We have two galaxies, the uh, M81 and M82. Now they are located about eight degrees west of Geysar or Lambda Draconis. You can see this is the end of the tail of Draco the dragon. So they're eight degrees west of Geysar. That's kind of a long star hop from there. But again, this is an obscure part of the sky. Or they're about 10 degrees northwest of Dubhi or Alpha Ursa Majoris here, the brightest star in Ursa Major. So you can move 10 degrees to the northwest with a Telrad or a finder scope or binoculars, and you can find these two galaxies. You can also say they're six and a half, deg uh, six, yeah, six and a half degrees north northeast of 23 Ursa Majoris here, but it's easier to find uh, W or maybe even the end of the tail of Draco the Dragon up here. So that's where you find these two galaxies, M81 and M82. M81 is known as Bode's galaxy, while M82, as you can see here, is known as the Cigar Galaxy. And so here's a wonderful sketch by an amateur astronomer, and this is M81, and this is M82. So they're quite different looking in appearance. And both these galaxies were discovered by Johann Bode on December 31st, 1744. And you can see uh, they're both roughly the same distance. Uh, M81 is about 11.8 million light years away. So that means it takes a beam of light 11.8 million years to reach us from M81. So when we see this galaxy in the sky through a, a telescope, preferably, you see it as it looked 11.8 million years ago. Uh, but M82, as you can see, is a little bit closer, but so only roughly 400,000 miles separate the two. So for galaxies, that's pretty close. So here's a beautiful image by Ivan Edar that I uh, uh, liberated from the internet. And this shows a very deep image of the region where you can see uh, M81 and M82 in all their glory. But you also see this uh, nebulosity here too. This is called the Integrated Flux Nebula. And it's basically uh, 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 dust and gas, dust primarily here, uh, suspended above our galaxy, kind of kind of held in place by the galaxy's gravity. And there's a bit of magnetism involved with the galaxy as well. So in the sky, the two galaxies are separated by about 37 arc minutes. Now, the full moon, for comparison, is about 30 arc minutes. So being just 37 arc minutes apart means you could squeeze in a whole full moon in here. So they're pretty close together. They're so close, you can squeeze them both in the same field of view in most amateur telescopes, maybe up to a focal length of roughly 2,500 millimeters. Because I used to be able to squeeze both of these in with my 10-inch uh, schmidt cassegrain and that had a focal length of 2,500 millimeters. So I know you can switch, uh, 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 fit them both into that field of view with, a, with, with at least a wide angle eyepiece, you know, like a good Nagler eyepiece or a panoptic eyepiece from Teleview, the really wide angle stuff. So here's M81 up close, and it is a beautiful galaxy. 
So M81 is a type SB galaxy, which means its arms aren't too tightly wound and they're not really loose. So it's kind of like an intermediate uh, galaxy in terms of the winding of its spiral arms. But M81 is also classified as a grand design galaxy, which means it has two symmetrical spiral arms with no obvious branches or spurs. You can see maybe a little branch uh, here, maybe fragments of ones here and here, but overall it's very, very symmetrical. And so that's why we also co consider this one a grand design galaxy. And only about 10% of all spirals are classified as grand design galaxies. And M81 or Bode's galaxy shown here is very comparable to the Milky Way. Our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. M81 is about 92,000 light years in diameter. Um, this contains at least 250 billion stars, which is, is again very comparable to our galaxy. Our galaxy is thought to contain between 200 and 400 billion stars. But this galaxy, where it's very different, it contains a 70 million solar mass black hole, which means at the center of this galaxy, there's a black hole over 70 million times the mass of the sun. The one at the center of our galaxy is only 4.31 million solar masses, you know, only. But uh, so this galaxy has a much more massive uh, central black hole than, our, than ours does. And so most galaxies are part of uh, clusters of galaxies, either poor galaxy clusters, which have uh, maybe tens or a few hundred galaxies, or there are rich galaxy clusters that have uh, several thousand galaxies. M81 is the largest galaxy in what's called the M81 group, which contains about 34 galaxies. So it is also part of a poor galaxy cluster, like the cluster that we are part of called the local group of galaxies. So again, nearby M81 is M82. And of course it looks very different in appearance. And it's also smaller. It's only about 40,000 light years in diameter. So a fraction the size of our galaxy. And it's considered a starburst galaxy. Now what this means is the galaxy is making stars at a horrific rate. And when this happens, that means there's some kind of interaction or direct collision between uh, one or more galaxies or two or more galaxies. So what happened here is probably about 10 million years ago, M81 and M82 came near each other. There was no direct collision. So we call this galaxy harassment. Now M81 looks none the worse for wear, right? It looks, you know, it's a nice symmetrical grand design galaxy. But because of M81's greater mass, it deeply disrupted M82 here and caused a massive burst of star formation. So we know that galaxies like this can't make stars at this rate on their own. So obviously with M81 nearby, it's pretty obvious they came very close to one another and they still are very close to one another. And it's causing a massive uh, burst of star formation in this galaxy. So M82 was much more effective because it's 10 times less massive than M81. It was once classified as irregular galaxy because it has such an odd shape, but um, a, a two, uh, uh, two symmetrical spiral arms were discovered in infrared in 2005. So it is a regular spiral galaxy with lots of star formation, but just seen edge on. So this is our first edge on galaxy that we see today. We'll review the disk edge on, and we'll see one more uh, edge on galaxy here today. And it looks a little more normal than M82 does here. But M82 uh, is a fascinating galaxy to view through a telescope. You can view sections of this uh, uh, dark nebulosity, but you really can't see all this stuff unless you uh, uh, take images of it. So now we'll kind of go to the opposite end of Ursa Major, but this little dotted line means that 
our next target, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, is actually just across the border in a constellation called Cain's Venetici, the hunting dogs. They don't show the label in this section of the uh, pocket sky atlas. So even though M51 is technically in another constellation, it's best to go off Elcade here or Eta Ursa Majoris. You just move three and a half degrees southwest, so much easier star hop uh, than earlier. And that takes you right to M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And here's a pretty typical uh, sketch by another talented uh, amateur astronomer. I love doing sketches myself, except for globular clusters, because how can you can you know make a uh, realistic picture of a globular cluster? You'll see what I mean here later if you're not familiar with those yet. So again, as far as galaxies go, M51 is pretty bright at 8.4 magnitude, and you can see it's about 23 million miles, uh, 23 million light years away. And uh, this was discovered by Charles Messier on October 13th, 1773. Now, Charles Messier was a French comet hunter who kept discovering objects that look like comets. And so this was one of his comet masqueraders. And he put it on the list of objects to, you know, avoid or not mistake with comets. But it turns out to be a really great list of deep sky objects. And M51 is one of those targets. And only, only roughly half of the objects in the uh, Messier catalog were actually discovered by Messier. So this is one of them, M51. Now, here is a fantastic image of M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, it always astounds me, but this galaxy is only about 60,000 light years in diameter. It is smaller than M81, but it's a bit closer to us, so it looks a, it's a, bit, it's a bit more distant. Uh, but it, it just, I always think of this galaxy being bigger than M81, but it's not. So you can again see it's a wonderful spiral galaxy, not quite a grand design galaxy because we see like a major uh, uh, spur here. There's like a big spur right here, right? You see it? Or a spur here. So this does have branches and spurs, so it's not a grand design galaxy. But what makes M51 special is it is a type two Seifert galaxy. So a Seifert galaxy, which were studied by Carl Seifert in the 1940s, this is an, uh, what we call an active galaxy, which means in the center of the galaxy, which looks very star-like, uh, that means the central black hole is actively feeding on material. But this is the type two Seifert galaxy, which doesn't look quite as brilliant because the accretion disk, the kind of dusty disk around the black hole blocks the, the black hole itself. So type two Seifert galaxies are where we view the accretion disk edge on. We'll illustrate this maybe a bit more later. So you can see M51 has a great deal of star formation but it's not really considered a starburst galaxy per se, but it sure does look like it has a lot of star formation. And you see this feature here. This is actually the dwarf elliptical galaxy, NGC 5195. They are not currently in the process of colliding, but uh, they are being disrupted. We can zoom out here. Uh, here's a really excellent uh, amateur image from Martin Pugh, and you can see uh, the disruption here, this big uh, cloud of stars that's been probably kicked out mainly from the smaller galaxy. So there is a bit of uh, galaxy harassment going on here, and maybe M51 is building its way toward becoming a um, starburst galaxy. So there's a bit of interesting history here related to M51, and that deals with uh, this telescope here that was built by this gentleman here, who is the third Earl of Ross, William Parsons. Now, he lived at Burr Castle in Parsonstown, now Burr, Ireland, in the late 19th century. And so uh, the third Earl of Ross here was, you know, quite wealthy, and he had a, a big fascination with astronomy. So he built 
what at the time was the world's largest telescope. This massive 72 inch Newtonian reflector dubbed the Leviathan of Parsons Town. And those objects he really wanted to study were those mysterious, faint, fuzzy patches of sky called nebulae. Now, in his time and a little bit earlier, all nebulae were thought to be stars that you couldn't resolve. But as we now know, some nebulae really are just clouds of dust and gas that could give birth to stars. And of course, other nebulae were galaxies, which are just, you know, big collections of stars uh, too far away to be, to be resolved individually. So that's why he wanted to build this massive telescope, because with a 72-inch mirror, as we'll call it for now, uh, had an enormous light grasp and revealed these nebulae like nobody ever saw before. And those that really caught his fascination were, of course, spiral in shape. But first, a little bit about the telescope here. So again, this is a Newtonian reflector, which means the light goes down the tube, reflects off the 72-inch mirror, as we'll call it now. You'll see what I mean by that later. The mirror has a parabolic uh, curve to it, so it reflects off up into a cone to a point off a secondary mirror here, which is at a 45 degree angle, something like that. And then it goes up to the eyepiece here where you can see this gentleman here. And you can see uh, Lord Ross was perhaps a bit on the hefty side. So this gentleman looks rather narrow. So I don't think this is Lord Ross at his telescope here. Maybe Lord Ross is behind the camera <laughs> or he's probably sleeping because he was up all night observing, right? So, uh, you know, this is kind of his observatory here per se, but you can see it's quite different from the observatories we have today because uh, this telescope could only move up and down in altitude. You could not turn it to different directions in the sky or azimuth. So he had to wait for an object, you know, to, to rise in the east, briefly move through his field of view like this. And then once it was out of the field of view and move toward the east, that was it for observing that object for the night. So usually what he did is he aimed the telescope in a certain part of the sky and maybe waited for objects to drift into the field of view. And he had to have a team with you know pulleys and cables move this telescope up and down. Within the past uh, 25, 30 years or so, this telescope has been refurbished I don't know if you can view through it. I can imagine the insurance nightmare that that would be. Uh, but if you're ever in uh, uh, Burr, Ireland, you can go check it out because uh, you know it's uh, there for viewing. So here's a sketch on the left of M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. But it, back then, they just referred to it as a spiral nebulae, as Lord Ross dubbed it. So you can see the uh, uh, satellite galaxy, NGC 5195. Here's a more modest astro image, not like the blow away Hubble sp Space Telescope one that I showed you earlier. And so based on uh, uh, Lord Ross's uh, sketch here, uh, this has become the first galaxy to be classified as spiral, thanks to the work of Lord Ross. Now here is the 72 inch mirror, as we'll call it. It is 72 inches across, you know, six feet, but it's not, uh, it's not made of glass with like silver or aluminum over it. It's made of an alloy called speculum, which is like two thirds copper and one third tin. Now the speculum tarnished easily. So here they are, they probably removed the mirror to polish it to put it back into the telescope, or it could be after its construction, I'm not really sure. I always love this image because I still can't decide to this day, is this a neck beard or does he wear some kind of scarf or towel around him? I still, I still can't decide today what, what exactly that is, <laughs> but I love that picture. So I did get to view M51 through this telescope but this here is at the Winter Star Party in the Florida Keys, but I viewed through this telescope at the 2001 Texas Star Party at M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and man, was that phenomenal. It just looks like a grayscale picture from a big telescope. So if you can ever view it through a big knob, 
do it. It is awesome. All right, so we're going to move back to Ursa Major and the Big Dipper, but this time, instead of using the pointer stars to go to Polaris, we're going to use the handle of the Big Dipper, which has a bend to it or an arc. And so if we follow the arc, it leads us to Arcturus, which is the brightest star in the constellation, Boades the Herdsman. Arcturus is actually one of the four brightest stars in the sky. I think it actually ranks about third. So yeah, Boades does not exactly look like a herdsman. This is supposed to be the figure overlaid with the, with the line drawing and yeah, not, not so much a herdsman. So Boades has a couple of really popular asterisms uh, that you can use instead. So my favorite and the one relevant to now, springtime, is the kite. It really does, for all the world, look like a giant uh, diamond-shaped kite in the sky. But as we transition into summertime, when Boades is still visible for several hours, at least in the early summer, not so much in late summer, it looks more like an ice cream cone. So we see one scoop of ice cream in the cone here, and nearby is another scoop of ice cream that just fell off. And so this U or C-shaped constellation is called Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. Now, I'm sure as soon as I said that, you cringed a little bit because we no longer like to hear the term corona. But we astronomers have been using this term for a long time. Of course, there's Corona Borealis, there's Corona Australis, there's the corona and the total solar eclipse. It's our term, and we're taking it back. Take that, coronavirus. So. Our next deep sky target is, again, not in the constellation I just led us to, but uh, it's still uh, the best constellation to use to find M3 here. And this time you can clearly see from the dotted lines and the label here that M3 is just across the border again in Cain's Venetici. It's a very obscure constellation, but it has some really good deep sky objects in it. And like M81, M82, it's kind of in an isolated part of the sky with no really bright stars nearby because um, you can go from Arcturus and travel 12 degrees to the northwest or 14 degrees from Izar, but still uh, that's quite a star hop to do. You know, So there, there's no really obvious stars to find it. So for a beginner, it can be a little challenging to find it first, but there it is nonetheless. So M3 does not really have a proper name but because it's in the constellation Cain's Venetici, and it's you know the brightest cluster in that constellation, I call it the Cain's Venetici cluster. I don't know why that's not a popular uh, term. And now we're much closer to home because M3 is a part of the Milky Way. So it's only 33,900 light years away. Uh, so much closer than our previous uh, targets. And here's an awesome sketch by Jeremy Perez, who has a great website called um, The Belt of Venus, and he's an avid uh, sketcher. This is where I gave up sketching because, you know, how you, you know, does it really look like that to an eyepiece? I would kind of doubt it. Uh, so I just couldn't convincingly do uh, globular clusters, so I kind of gave up sketching. So M3 here was discovered again by Charles Messier on May 3rd. 1764. And so this was the third entry in his famous uh, catalog. But it wasn't resolved into stars uh, until 1784 by William Herschel, who used much larger telescopes than Messier ever did. And uh, globular clusters are among my favorite objects to look at because in many cases, they look like the pictures you see in books. But of course, uh, digital cameras are very sensitive today. Uh, so uh, many of the images we now see of globular clusters like this one are you know, more spectacular than what you would see with the unaided eye. So here's a great image of M3. So we estimate that M3 has about 500,000 stars and it's thought to be about 8 billion years old, which is fairly young 
yes, young for a globular cluster. As we'll, we'll see another globular cluster here soon, that's uh, quite a bit older, but more on that here later. So M3 contains 274 known variable stars by far the highest number found in any globular cluster. So some stars vary in brightness because they're in a binary star system and one star eclipses the other. These were the first type known called eclipsing variable stars. But many variable stars are single stars that pulsate slowly like beating hearts. And that's what we see in this animation here. So this is a series of images put into an animated GIF. And you can see some stars, you know, slowly pulsate like this one here. So 133 of the 274 variable stars in this cluster are what we call RR Lyra stars. Now RR Lyra stars are very similar to what we know as Cepheid variable stars. So Cepheids are typically giant or super giant stars. And so they're easier to see when they're further away. I will, uh, I can talk more about Cepheids in another talk because I, I cover those in the autumn talk, I think. Um, but our, our Lyra stars have a mass and size similar to the sun. So when they are in globular clusters, uh, they're quite a bit fainter than Cepheids. But we can use our, our Lyra stars to measure distances as well, just like we can with Cepheids, because they also have what's called a period luminosity relationship, where their period of variation, you know, to go from bright to faint to bright is related to their true brightness or their absolute magnitude. So if we can determine their absolute magnitude, and we can see their apparent magnitude in the sky, we can use them to figure out how far away the star and cluster is. So there you go. So our next constellation, Hercules, is a little difficult to find at first because uh, there are no stars brighter than 2.75 magnitude in Hercules. But what you can do is use Arcturus, so, you know, follow the arc to Arcturus. And you can use Vega in the constellation Lyra. Now, Vega is a summer constellation, which means as we get into the evenings in the summer, uh, Vega is more prominently visible. But at least in later spring, you don't have to wait very long for Vega to rise. So what I do to find Hercules, if I even myself get confused sometimes, is I draw a line between Vega and Arcturus. Now you go from the center of the line, but drift a little toward Vega, and you'll come across this pattern here called the Keystone. So the Keystone is an asterism in the constellation Hercules. And we call it the Keystone because it looks like, you know, a Keystone, like say at the top of an arch. So our deep sky target in Hercules is the grandest globular cluster in the northern sky, M13. Now this time, compared to M3, this is an easy star hop. We just go uh, two and a half degrees south of Eta Herculeus here. So here's the keystone, and you just go south of Eta here. And so it's really easy to find. So M13, being in the constellation Hercules is known as the Great Hercules Cluster, or less formally, you know, the Hercules Cluster. So it's so bright at 5.8 magnitude, you can see it with the naked eye if you have good eyesight and you're under exceptionally dark skies. And it's about 22,000 200 light years away, so uh, a bit closer to us than M3. And now, quite interestingly, M13 was discovered by Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet fame in 1714, and he did discover it to the with the naked eye. So, how could the ancients, you know, like the ancient Greeks and the Babylons, how could they have never noticed this thing there before? They had much darker skies. And they observed the skies ob obsessively, and somehow they missed it. So that's quite the that's quite the mystery. 
So remember, we see M13 as it looked 22,200 years ago. So light from M13 dates back to the upper Paleolithic or late Stone Age, where we find the earliest known evidence of organized settlements. And so every time you put your eye up to the eyepiece here, and view M13 through a telescope, you see it as it looked when humanity was just starting to build the first you know, settlements. It's amazing. And it took 22,000 plus years for that light to get to us. It's just always so incredible. So here's a phenomenal image of M13. Don't expect to see the star colors, of course. It all looks pretty uh, uh, whitish or kind of grayish or, pearl gray light. Uh, so it, it doesn't, um, you know, it's, it's closer to us than M3, but it only contains about 300,000 stars, but it looks more spectacular because it's closer to us. And it's about 145 light years in diameter. Now this cluster is about 11.65 billion years old. So that's much more typical for a globular cluster. So as we see, Globular clusters like M3 and especially M13 are composed of very old stars. And these clusters, M3, M13, and other globular clusters have large elliptical orbits around the center of the galaxy. And it takes M13 about 500 million years to complete uh, uh, one galactic orbit. And its orbit can carry it as far out as 800,000 light years. So we view it at a time when it's only about 22,000 light years away. So we find globular clusters in what we call the galactic halo. So here we have the central bulge of the galaxy, kind of the downtown of the Milky Way, where we have this big spherical collection of, again, very old stars, not quite as old as those as we find in globular clusters, but they're very similar in many ways. And at the very center of the galactic uh, bulge here is a supermassive black hole. And then we have the disk, which resolves into spiral arms. And of course, the sun is located about two thirds of the way from the galactic center in the disk of the Milky Way. And it's in the disk, is where we find emission nebulae, you know, regions of star formation, open clusters like, say, the Pleiades. But above and below the plane of the galaxy in this large spherical cloud is the halo. Now, there are lots of faint stars out here like uh, white dwarfs, which are technically dead stars, red dwarfs, but great collections of stars called globular clusters. So this is where we find globular clusters in the sky. Now, again, globular clusters are very old. So they formed along with the original version of the Milky Way. I say original version because in roughly 13 billion years or so, um, the Milky Way has absorbed several other galaxies. And so it's a lot bigger than it once was. And it'll keep absorbing galaxies until we collide with the Andromeda galaxy. So these stars are so old in globular clusters that they formed at a time when the periodic table was only hydrogen, helium, and a dash of lithium. So these stars are almost exclusively composed of nothing but hydrogen and helium. And uh, so that's uh, one of the reasons why you know they're very old. But in contrast, stars in the disk are much younger, maybe you know a few billion or even hundreds of millions of years old or younger. And also uh, because they're composed of just hydrogen and helium, we consider these metal poor stars. Now metal in astronomy means something a little bit different. In astronomy, metal refers to anything not hydrogen and helium. Even, even oxygen is considered a metal in astronomy. Because remember when these things formed, there was only hydrogen and helium and a trace of metals from a previous generation of star we haven't really dis yet discovered. That's one of the goals of the James Webb Space Telescope is to find the first generation of star, which our galaxy very likely does not have. 
If it does, it doesn't have very many because we haven't found any yet. Even the metal poorest of stars have at least a, a tenth of a percent or less of metals. All righty, so we go back to the Big Dipper again. And this time we're going to go back to the pointer stars, but we're going to go the opposite direction. And when you go from the pointer stars to the opposite direction, it takes you between a backward looking question mark and a right angled triangle that makes up the constellation Leo the Lion. So here we are, the great lion of the sky. So Leo has two prominent bright stars, Regulus, his heart, and the nebula, his tail. The backward question mark is the springtime's uh, prominent asterism called the sickle. So in the summer, we have the summer triangle, very bright and prominent and large. In the fall, we have the great square, which isn't as bright, but still the great square is very prominent. In the winter, we have the winter hexagon, but all we have in spring is a backward question mark called the sickle, which is like an old farming tool. You know, you, you swing the sickle, you know, there's like a blade here and you, you know, chop wheat or, <laughs> or something along that line. But I've had, you know, many students of mine uh, consider the sickle to be a separate group of stars. But remember, the Big Dipper is just an asterism in Ursa Major. So the sickle is an asterism that's in the constellation Leo. So technically, these stars are part of Leo, but we use the sickle to help identify Leo a bit easier. So here's the lion in the sky. And yes, he's, he's roaring overhead. So yeah, lions might be the king of beasts, but remember, this really is just a random collection of stars that we see in the sky. So Leo is not the king of spring. We haven't gotten to that yet. So there is a cool story behind this mythological figure in the sky. So the origin of the celestial lion can be traced back to the Babylonians, where it was later inherited by the ancient Greeks and became an important part of their mythology. The Greeks believed the lion originated from the moon and later fell to the earth to torment the people of Nemea. The Nemean lion was much larger than his terrestrial cousins. His coat was impervious to fire and metal weapons. It terrified the people of Nemea who were desperate for help. But then Hercules, the son of Zeus and the strongest man in the world was sent to kill the lion in the first of his 12 labors. After failing to kill the lion with spears and arrows, Hercules wrestled the lion to death and then skinned the lion with his own claw. Personally, I kind of feel sorry for the lion, you know, but, uh, you know, there we go. But now the lion, of course, is preserved forever in the sky above for us. So Leo is just filled with galaxies kind of like uh, great hairballs from the massive lion, you could say. So uh, three of the prominent galaxies of Leo are located his hindquarters here, the right angled triangle with the nebula here. So we can actually go uh, two and a half degrees southeast from Sheraton or Theta Leonis, and that's where we find the famous Leo triplet, or as I like to call it, the Leo trio. So it's also known as the M66 group because M66 here is the most massive member and it may be part of a larger cluster with the M96 group over here. So perhaps uh, the Leo trio is just a outline member of the M96 group. We're not really sure yet. But here are all three galaxies of the Leo triplet in the same field of view. Now again, M65, I, I forget which is which, uh, M65 and M66 were discovered by Charles Messier again on March 1st, 1780. But this galaxy here, NGC 3628, was discovered by William Herschel on April 8th, 1784, so about four years later. All the galaxies are roughly 35 to 36 million light years away. 
and you can see their sizes here. So they uh, have a, a pretty presentable size in the eyepiece of a telescope. So here are the two galaxies, uh, two prominent galaxies together. We have uh, M66 on the left, because it's much more prominent looking, and M65 on the right. So M66 and M65 uh, may be separated by only 200,000 light years if their distances are the same. Not quite as close as M81, M82, but they are still pretty easy to fit within the same field of view of a telescope as we saw from the previous sketch. So here is M65 up close, and this is considered an intermediate spiral galaxy. Now, by intermediate, it means it kind of has properties of both a regular spiral galaxy and what we call a barred spiral galaxy. So a barred spiral galaxy has a bar of stars stretching outward from the galactic disk. And you can see, or outward from the galactic nucleus, I'm sorry. So you can kind of see a bar here, but it, not really an obvious bar here. So that's why it's considered an intermediate spiral galaxy. And this one is very comparable to M81 or the Milky Way at 94,000 light years across. So it would take a beam of light, you know, 94,000 years to get, say, from here to here. It may have weakly interacted with other Leo triplet galaxies about 800 million years ago, resulting in its slightly warped disk. And in this Hubble image, we can see how the galaxy is low in gas and dust. So compared to the next spiral galaxy we'll see, there is very little star formation. So here is an image of M66, or at least the bulk of it, from the Hubble Space Telescope. And again, this is an intermediate spiral galaxy as well, but not quite obvious bars like with M65. And it's about 87,000 light years in diameter. And it has a warp shape, which is likely due to interactions with NGC 3628 and possibly M65 nearby. But you can see it contains a lot more gas and dust. So there is a great deal more star formation. Here is the third member of the Leo triplet, NGC 3628, which has many names. It's known as the Hamburger Galaxy, which is kind of obvious here. Sarah's Galaxy. I'm not really sure of the origin of that one. King Hamlet's Ghost, I don't even know about that one, and the Vanishing Galaxy. But to me, it always looked like a peanut. So I call it, you know, uh, the Peanut Galaxy. You know, it, it, doesn't it look like Mr. Peanut to you? It, it does to me. So you can see this is our other edge-on spiral galaxy. It is seen nearly three degrees from being perfectly edge-on. And this one's about 78,000 light years in diameter. but Due to interactions with the other galaxies, it has a 300,000 light year long tidal tail. You can see the bulk of it here. So we saw how uh, stars were disrupted around M51 because of the interactions with that nearby galaxy. And so we see another tidal tail caused by interactions with these two galaxies here. Very likely, they will all three merge one day and become a supergiant elliptical galaxy. Now, nearby Leo, just to the uh, west of Leo, is Cancer the Crab, which looks like an upside down Y in the sky. But believe it or not, the deep sky object in Cancer, at least under dark skies, is easier to find than the constellation that it lies in. You really can't say that about any other deep sky object in the sky, but that's kind of how obscure the stars of Cancer are. With light pollution, they get lost, but with binoculars, you can see it's a deep sky ob object there, which is M44, the Beehive Cluster. So it's pretty much right near the center of the Y, you know, where the to where the three parts meet here, but it's just west of a line between Acillus Borealis 
and Acillus australis, you know, north south star. And um, they're also known as uh, Gamma and Delta Cancri. So with binoculars, it's very prominent in the sky. So this is a great binocular object, especially compared to the other objects we've seen today. So again, M44 is known as the Beehive Cluster. We're not really sure of the origin of that name, but you, know, you, you can see a bunch of little bees buzzing around an imaginary hive here. But it's also known as the Presepi, which is Latin for manger, because the stars, uh, uh, Acillus, uh, you know, Borealis and so on, they're thought to be uh, mules, you, you know? <laughs> so it's one of the nearest open clusters to Earth at only 577 light years, by far the nearest object that we will look at today. And again, it is visible to the unaided eye. It's very obvious uh, visibly to the unaided eye. So it's been known since ancient times. And here's a beautiful view that shows many of the star's colors. The cluster has a core diameter you know, the really bright stars here are about 23 light years across and contains about 1,000 stars in all. It contains about 60% M dwarfs or red dwarfs, which isn't surprising because red dwarfs are by far the most common type of star in the sky. 30% of the stars in this cluster are, are like the sun, F. G, G or K type stars. The sun is a G type star. There are 2% A type stars, which are hotter than the sun. Plus there are five giants. Those are mainly the big uh, bright orange ones and 11 known white dwarfs, you know, stars that have died. The cluster itself is about 600 million years old, which is old to us but for a glob, you know, compared to a globular cluster, these stars are very young. And so far, we've discovered two planets orbiting separate stars, both hot Jupiters, you know, Jupiter-like planets very close to their star, uh, that were both discovered in September of 2012. So we do know of two planets around uh, at least two of these stars in the cluster. So we once again follow the arc to Arcturus. And then we finish up here by saying, drive a spike to Spica. So you can do this through most of the spring. So just remember, follow the arc to Arcturus, drive a spike to Spica. And Spica is most definitely the brightest star in the constellation Virgo, the Virgin. So she has this V-shaped pattern here to help you remember her name. But these are her arms to uh, uh, reach up and grab the warmth of the sun, which can pass high above in Cancer there, because Cancer's along the ecliptic. And you see Spica. And these are like her, her, her legs here. So you can imagine her body. And there she is. At least that's one representation of Virgo. So again, Virgo, is a, a galaxy constellation. Now we can go uh, 11 degrees west of Spica, so another pretty long star hop, or we can go five, degree, five and a half degrees northeast of Algorab or Delta Corvi, which I uh, uh, inadvertently cut out of the image here. But if you kind of go from Spica over this way, uh, from Porima, you know, uh, M104 here is like, like the uh, right angle part of a triangle here. So that's how you can kind of find M104, the Sombrero galaxy. I love observing this galaxy because, man, it looks very much like, you know, lower grade images, not the spectacular image that I'll show you here shortly. So this galaxy is 31.1 million light years away. And again, at 8 eighth magnitude, it is bright for a galaxy. This one was discovered by Pierre Machain, who was the assistant to Charles Messier on May 11th, 1781. And it is the brightest galaxy within a radius of 32.6 million light years around the Milky Way. That's an amazing fact. You would su suspect uh, closer galaxies would be brighter, but as, you know, most of the galaxies 
near us are, you know, small. So at, even when they're nearby, their, their surface brightness is really low. But here's a spectacular image of M104 with the Hubble Space Telescope. It has a diameter of about 50,000 light years, so about half the diameter of the Milky Way. It's surrounded by up to 1,200 to 2,000 globular clusters, you know, like M3 or M13. By comparison, our galaxy only has about 155 globular clusters. This one contains a supermassive black hole of 1 billion solar masses. And again, it's one of my favorite targets to observe every spring. And I swear, every time I observe this galaxy, if you're nearby, you can hear me humming this tune, honestly. Because it, it does look like a giant sombrero hat. So it just, may, it just gives me joy to uh, hum that little tune when I view it through a telescope. So the Spitzer Space Telescope, whose image is shown here, found that the halo is larger and more massive than previously thought. And this is indicative of a giant elliptical galaxy. So it would seem that the Sombrero Galaxy is a large elliptical galaxy that devoured a dusty spiral galaxy. Because we used to think of the Sombrero Galaxy as being a spiral galaxy. But it's really more elliptical than it is anything. So our next target in Virgo is M87. Now M87 is located about eight degrees west of Venda Beatrix or 10 degrees um, east of the nebula here. You can basically draw a line between the two. And again, it's just a little bit closer to M87, kind of like how I found Hercules er earlier. So M87 is known by its radio source name as well, Virgo A, but today you can call it the king of spring. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this galaxy is the king of spring. You might be thinking to yourself, hey, I've observed this through a telescope before. It's just a little faint puffball, but have some respect. Hopefully after today, when you view M87 through a telescope, you'll think the same thing that I do, that yes, this is the king of spring, because you have to do more than just use your eyes when viewing some of these galaxies through a telescope. You have to combine your eye with your mind's eye, your, your knowledge of what we know about this galaxy. So again, a few basic facts here. Out of all the galaxies we're observing today, it is the faintest at just about 9.6 magnitude here. And it's uh, fairly distant at uh, 53 and a half million light years away. But you know, compared to most galaxies, that's still pretty close. And this was also discovered by Charles Messier in 1781. So here it is, this big dominant galaxy right here. All this glowing here, that's all stars, and especially the bright part here, that is all M87. So M87 is a super giant elliptical galaxy whose brightest portion, like this section here, is 120,000 light years in diameter. If we include the extended galactic envelope, it's roughly 490,000 light years across. It, it extends beyond the image here that I'm showing you here today. Its immense volume contains an estimated 2.7 trillion stars. That is trillion with a T. So by comparison, our galaxy is 100,000 light years apart, which is comparable to the bright portion of M87. But our galaxy is flat, you know, and contains 200 to 400 billion stars. This is spherical. And so pretty much the entire galaxy, including the, the, the fainter outer portion, 
you know, has 2.7 trillion stars. Our galaxy has, a, again, roughly 150, 160 globular clusters. This one has 12,000 of them. Its total mass is at least 200 times that of the Milky Way, making it one of the most massive galaxies in the local universe. So have some respect for the king. M87 famously has a jet moving at relativistic speeds, roughly 20 to 30 percent the speed of light from the galactic center. You can see a better view of the jet here. Escaping from nearby, it's supermassive black hole. Now this black hole, holy cow, uh, it's roughly or at least 3.5 billion solar masses. 3.5 billion times the mass of the sun. But upper measurements place it at 7.22 billion solar masses. And this jet, this relativistic jet of matter, mainly gas, is 6,000 light years long and traveling out of the nucleus. It's again escaping near the black hole, not from the black hole, of course, because nothing can escape from the inside of a black hole, but the jet escapes near the black hole. This view here of M87 is by the Spitzer Space Telescope, where we can again see the uh, jet. This is the jet that we see. There's evidence of another jet here, but we can't view it because of something called relativistic beaming. I'm gonna leave it up to you to research exactly what relativistic beaming is. So I'll give you a little homework project to work on there. It's a little technical to explain, but here's of course is a now famous image from the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a series of radio telescopes all over the world. And just a few years ago, they focused their view on the supermassive black hole in M87. And this is basically the shadow of the event horizon, the black hole itself. So here's what the supermassive black holes in the hearts of galaxies look like. Again, the black hole itself has millions or billions of solar masses. We're not exactly sure how they get so big. That's a, a big mystery still. And you can see they're located in this uh, central cavity in the disk where the black hole lurks, but it's very narrow. But nearby, there's this disk that puffs out a bit where it's moving very fast and generating a magnetic field. And the magnetic field becomes twisted into these rope-like tubes because of the rapid rotation of the accretion disk just outside the black hole. So it's moving very fast and it gets very hot, generates a magnetic field. And before some of the material gets pulled into the black hole, it gets shot out in these jets of material that again move at relativistic speeds, significant fractions of speed of light. So again, you can see the black hole is hidden deep inside this narrow central well. And the outer part of the disk is a fat, dense donut or torus that blocks our view of dusty gas around the black hole. So like M51 is a Seifert galaxy, a type two Seifert galaxy, because we view this dusty disk here edge on and it, and it blocks our view of the black hole. So here's this supermassive black hole in animation. There's the event horizon there. And you can see it's in this deep well around this disk or in the disk, I should say. And there's the jet escaping from M87. We zoom out and we see the larger galaxy. So the galaxy itself is far more massive than the supermassive black hole. So the galaxy will not be absorbed by the black hole one day. It's all the stuff is in orbit and unless it gets too close, it'll be fine. So M87 is at the heart. I mean, the, the absolute center of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. Now, again, we live in a poor galaxy cluster that has uh, to date 
roughly 54 galaxies. But M87 is located at the center of the Virgo cluster, which is one of those rich galaxy clusters with currently about 2,000 known members. We only see the bright ones here because, of course, most of the galaxies are small and faint, so they're difficult to see. And here are many of the prominent galaxies labeled. M87 is at the absolute center, but we see two other giant elliptical galaxies in M84, M86 here that are part of uh, Markarian's chain, this chain of galaxies here, which is just kind of an optical line of sight type uh, thing here. From the Pocket Sky Atlas, there are some close-up charts in the back, and this is one of them that shows you a map of the Virgo cluster. So uh, the, the cluster subtends or takes up about uh, eight degrees of sky centered around Virgo. It, it does spill over into Leo there. M87, lost in here somewhere, there it is, uh, may be the most massive member, but the brightest member of the Virgo cluster is actually M49 down here. So again, we have poor and rich galaxy clusters. And again, the Milky Way is part of a poor galaxy cluster called the local group. And here we see the sun two thirds of the way from the galactic center in the Milky Way. And here we go. So there's the Milky Way and the large and small Magellanic clouds. And now we can see other galaxies in the local group, including the Andromeda galaxy and M33, the Triangulum galaxy. I talk about those in the fall. So now we're zooming away from the local group. Now we see another poor galaxy cluster. This could be the M81 group we talked about earlier. This galaxy here to me always looks like M81, but M81 is the nearest galaxy group to the local group, as mentioned earlier. Now here we see a rich galaxy cluster, like the Virgo supercluster of galaxies with several thousand galaxies. Now, as we've learned within the past 50 years or so, both poor and rich clusters are part of super clusters of galaxies. We used to think we lived in a poor a, uh, a super cluster called the Virgo super cluster, but we now know the Virgo super cluster is part of the Laniakea super cluster of galaxies. Lani Achaea is home to the Milky Way and 100,000 other nearby galaxies identified by astronomers at the University of Hawaii and University of Lyon in September of 2014. Lani Achaea means immense heaven in Hawaiian and it's about 300 to 500 galaxy clusters. Lani Achaea is part of the Pisces Cetus Supercluster Complex which is the galaxy filament that contains Laniakea and is about 100 billion light years long and 150 million light years wide. So each of these bright knots, like we saw in the video just now, that's a super cluster of galaxies that are all connected by these filaments and walls of super clusters of galaxies. So this on the grandest scale you know, is called the large scale structure of the universe or the cosmic web. And between the uh, filaments and walls of superclusters, we have great voids of space that are devoid of matter. So where are we in the universe? Let's try to summarize a little bit of what we learned today. So of course you are at, hopefully at your home address right now, which is in some city, state or province in some country around the world. You most likely live on a continent or island. Of course, most of us here live in the North American continent as seen here. The North American continent, for example, is located in the Western hemisphere, but perhaps you're listening to this from the Eastern hemisphere. And that's located on Earth. And, this is, and the rest here is what we all have in common. 
the Earth is part of the solar system. The solar system is located in the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is just one member of the local group of galaxies, which includes the Andromeda galaxy. The local group of galaxies is what I call a part of the Virgo supercluster lobe, which is what we used to think of as the local supercluster or the Virgo supercluster. But now we know the Virgo supercluster is just one small lobe of the larger Laniakea supercluster of galaxies. And the Laniakea supercluster of galaxies is part of the Pisces Cetus supercluster complex. That is the filament of superclusters that we live in. And that is part of the universe. So that's where we are in the universe right now, or really pretty much all the time, except for maybe the first few lines here. So I want to thank you for joining me for this tour of the spring sky.